Hi folks, welcome back. Today I come to you with another paper from the very recently concluded Operating Systems Design and Implementation Symposium. And this paper talks about building an operating system for a data center where hardware resources are disaggregated. The work was done by researchers at Purdue. Before we talk about what disaggregation means and its implications on OS design, let's look at the current paradigm. The unit of deployment in a data center today is a single server. That's one machine that has CPU, RAM, and storage. However, this model is now beginning to face many problems. And the biggest problem is that when your data center is made out of monolithic servers, the bin packing problems of fitting many applications across these servers becomes really hard. Let me give a contrived example. Supposing you have two machines in your data center, each of them has one gigabyte of RAM free in it. And you now want to run an application that needs two gigabytes of RAM. You can't run it on either machine because each of them only has one gigabyte of RAM free. However, across the two machines, you do have two gigabytes of RAM. So if only you could find a way to combine the RAM of each individual machine into one collective virtualized pool of RAM, you would be able to break out of this bin packing problem and find enough RAM for your application. And that's essentially what disaggregation means. What disaggregation means is that you put a layer of virtualization over all your computing resources and treat them as these giant pools. So all the RAM in all the machines in your data center gets treated as one giant pool of RAM. Same thing for storage, same thing for CPU, and so on. And when you do this, then the bin packing problem basically just goes away. The way you do this is by simply accessing all these resources via message passing on the network. So you can treat RAM as one giant pool if you can just access the RAM on all the other machines in your data center over a very fast local network. And in fact, this inefficiency brought about by the bin packing problem is borne out in the utilization numbers of various large internet companies like Google and Alibaba, where you can see that the memory utilization across a large data center hovers in the 50 to 60% range. It is these trends in hardware design that are now making disaggregation in the data center very possible and in fact are pushing towards it. You have very fast networks like InfiniBand and remote access to memory which make it very competitive to access a remote machine's RAM. The second hardware trend driving disaggregation is that hardware devices are now able to access the network directly without needing to go through the CPU. And finally, these new complex hardware devices have a lot of onboard processing power. And this allows application logic and kernel logic to execute directly on the hardware component itself. They don't have to go out to the main CPU to do this. So hardware disaggregation in the data center is definitely an idea whose time has arrived. And I think we will see more and more work directed in this area. I talked about these kinds of hardware trends in another paper where I discussed the implications of I.O. now becoming as fast as or even faster than the CPU. So I'd encourage you to go check out that video if you're interested in that. The key design problem that this paper deals with is that if you disaggregate all your hardware resources, how do you manage and virtualize them? How do you design operating system abstractions 
that can work with this disaggregated pool of hardware. The central design philosophy that the authors propose in this paper is that when hardware is disaggregated, the OS should be also. The architecture that they are proposing is called a split kernel, which is basically a monitor on a hardware resource. These are meant to be stateless and loosely coupled with other monitors managing other hardware resources. Each monitor only locally manages its own local hardware and communicates with other monitors when it needs to access remote resources. These monitors communicate with each other only via message passing on the network. The authors in this paper implement the split kernel in an operating system called Lega OS. The primary abstraction that Lega OS exports to applications is what they call a vNode, which is a set of virtual servers. One of these virtual servers can run across multiple hardware components like processor, memory, and storage, and also one hardware component, such as one storage disk, can host resources for multiple virtual servers. The kernel functionality is split into three types of monitors. A process monitor, which abstracts the CPU, a memory monitor, which manages memory, and a storage monitor that abstracts storage. One of the main design challenges in implementing a kernel that does this is memory management over a bunch of remote machines. If you look at modern processor and operating system architecture, they have a lot of machinery like page tables and look-aside buffers that manage local memory. We need to design something that functions similarly but manages memory across a range of machines. At a high level, the split kernel architecture looks like this, where we have these individual monitors managing local pools of resources like storage or RAM or CPU, and then they coordinate and talk to each other via messaging on the network. One of the design principles of the split kernel was to be as stateless as possible. And this leads to components not being coherent across machines. What this means is that if you're executing a process that is using two components, there is no effort at the operating system level to keep those two components in sync with each other. And this implies that Lego OS does not support writable shared memory across processes. So this would rule out some applications, for example, where two processes communicate with each other using shared memory. However, this is a pretty reasonable design decision because seeing applications that use shared memory is not very common in data center applications at all. Supporting it would also make both the hardware and software much more complex. Another key design decision of Lego OS was to support the Linux system call interface. And this allows them to run unmodified Linux applications on Lego OS. Now, when you're abstracting memory across many machines, you don't want every memory access to go over the network because that would still slow down your application a lot. However, the saving grace is that memory accesses show a lot of temporal locality. One example that they mention here is that 90% of the memory accesses in one app went to just 0.06% of the total memory of that application with similar skewed numbers for many other typical applications. To take advantage of this locality to boost performance, what the authors are proposing here is that when they're running an application on a P component, which is their term for a processor component, they use part of the local RAM as a cache. 
this means that the vast majority of memory accesses, even though they are virtualized across a range of machines, will hit this cache. They call this the X cache or the extended cache. An X cache hit is handled completely in hardware, just like a usual local memory cache hit. However, when there's a miss in the X cache, then Lego OS kicks in and the process monitor fetches the missed memory from a remote memory component and puts it into the local X cache. And as is common in cache management algorithms, if the X cache is full, the monitor throws away some locally cached data to make space for the data it has just fetched remotely. The authors have implemented Lego OS in C on the x86-64 architecture and it can run on most commodity hardware and it supports a substantial subset covering the commonly used Linux system calls. So let's look at some benchmark results. One of the benchmarks was the Parsec suite which includes some common cluster workloads and these were the results they saw on these benchmarks. These were all run with one processor and an X cache size of 128 megabytes. We see that stream cluster is the best performing one because it accesses memory in a batched fashion and each batch is small enough to fit inside the X cache. These other two benchmarks have much larger working sets that do not fit completely within the X cache and hence need to go out to the network to fetch their memory very often. Another benchmark they ran was on TensorFlow and Phoenix, which is a MapReduce implementation, and they compared it to running on a single Linux server large enough to fit these applications in RAM. And in that case, they saw slowdowns of about 1.6 to 1.3x. However, we should note that this is much better than swapping to disk or swapping directly to remote memory because LEGO OS has a much more efficiently implemented network stack and its memory paging subsystem is much simpler compared to that of Linux. In terms of benchmarking, it would have been nice to see benchmarks of much larger applications that don't fit on a single machine that actually need many, many machines to run on. Though I understand that's pretty difficult to do in an academic setting. I also think that the main benefits of this will really kick in when done across a very large number of machines. And when you're doing that, there are many considerations for cluster management and data center management that also come into play. And I hope the authors look at some of those issues in future work. So that was a look at Lego OS, which is a novel kernel architecture called split kernel that enables the use of disaggregated resources in large data centers. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time. Thank you very much.